Welcome to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Well, we got our supercharged Silverado in the shop, and I noticed when I was driving in and I had no tack, and also pulled a code, which was a P0335, which was a crank position sensor code. Those are pretty much dead indications that we have a bad crank position sensor. But one more test to verify it. We got our master tech, Josh, in there, and he's gonna crank it over. We're gonna actually look at the RPM and see if we're getting anything from the actual crank sensor on the scan tool here. Go ahead, Josh. Nothing, nothing, nothing there. And sometimes it runs, and I know what you guys are gonna say, well, it's not supposed to run without the crank sensor. Well, in this truck, it does. It actually looks at the mass airflow sensor, drawn a little bit of air in there, and it reverts to the cam sensor. And it can run, but it's definitely not running good. What is a crank sensor and what does it do? Well, fortunately for us, our friends from Console Lab, they actually sent down a board, man, from Canada. This is incredible. Four of the most prevalent sensors on every vehicle out there. So pretty much can guarantee one of these is on your vehicle. We'll start right here with the passive sensor. Now the passive sensor has no voltage going to it. It's your old wheel speed sensor. It generates an AC voltage. You can take ohms of resistance right here. I got the ohmic value. You can check that sensor. It's about 800. Look at your service manual. Or you can come over and look at AC. It produces an AC voltage. I'll fire it up and you can see what's going on. As I turn it up and down, it actually changes voltage. Now that's also susceptible to air gap. It's an analog signal. Think about when your dad or mom used to have you there by the TV moving the antenna. That's an old analog signal. So I can dial it back. And as I dial it back, you can actually see the voltage start to go away. That will actually mess it up. That'll cause a code, that'll cause problems. So make sure you set the air gap correctly. Now our next one, these are called active sensors. Why? Because they have voltage going to it. This is a Hall effect. This is an on and off pulse. And if you look over here on our digital oscilloscope right there, you can actually see the on off pulse. That's five on, five off. It could be 12 on, 12 off, but it's actually reading that tooth ring in there and it's pulsing on and off so it knows where it's at. You can see it right here. This is the tooth ring and there's the gap for the number one cylinder as I spin it around. It's looking at that. Now we're going on to the active sensors, the magneto resistive sensors. Really, we're just getting better and better down the line here. This is pretty cool. This is a radial sensor. Now this one only has two wires, but I can come over, I can move it to the signal wire over here, and you can see it right there. That's just kind of varying a voltage. It may vary it slightly, it may vary it a little bit, but it's varying the voltage. Now that's a little more accurate because you're getting a better reading on the tooth ring, but this is also susceptible to air gap. What do I mean? Well, think about that digital cable signal. Check this out. I dial it away, bam, gone. Dial it back, it's there. Bam, gone, it's there. Okay, just like your digital cable. You either have television or you don't. That's how the cars work today. The last one on here, this is the axial strip. Now this one, a lot of autonomous cars and stuff have this because it's super precise. There's a bunch of magnetic fields on this little wheel right here as it spins around and it's looking at it. Matter of fact, we can see them right here. Look at the radial and then bam, look at the axial. So many more signals. So that just means it's a lot more precise as we're going down the road. And here's a pretty cool story for you. Our buddy from Console Lab, John, he's got the Hill Assist on his truck. And he had mentioned that, that he has the actual magneto resistance on the axial sensor over here on the side. And what happens is when the car starts to see it start to roll, it's looking at those teeth. And as those teeth back up, well, then you know you have a problem. It locks that in there. It's also looking at a couple other sensors as well. Now on the last one there, the strips are so close together that when that wheel rolled, bam, he'd even feel it roll with Hill Assist. Now Dave's gonna have to dig into our Silverado, but only on Tech Garage. We have an engine right here so I can show you what's gonna happen. He's gonna have to get underneath there and remove the starter. And when you remove the starter, you can actually see the sensor's located right here. And then that tooth ring we talked about, well, it's located on the crankshaft. I took the oil pan off so you can see it. We're actually losing signal. We don't have signal. Something's going on. But we're going to have to follow a diagnostic flow chart on our supercharged Silverado. You don't want to miss that. We'll be back with more Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, is brought to you by Magic Creeper, the most versatile creeper ever. Steel rubber products, quality crafted rubber parts and weather stripping. And by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Well, I am under a truck. This is our Chevy Silverado. We saw last segment that it has an extended crank. That means it takes forever 
to start this thing. And we suspected a bad crank position sensor, but we wanted to bring it in just to be sure. Now, we got it up on the lift. If you have a Magic Creeper, you can do it in your driveway at home. All you have to do to get to that crank position sensor is remove the starter. So we just removed the two bolts to get the starter out of there. It was a little hard to wrench the starter out of the way, but we did it. So then that reveals the crank position sensor. You pull off the connector, one bolt to take out the crank position sensor. We got it removed and we are ready to check out the sensor to see what we've got. Well, I'll tell you what, you made short work of that, Dave. And you know, the tendency is just to put a sensor in there and make sure it's good, but you had to pull a whole starter and maybe it's even worse than that. Maybe you have to pull a whole bunch of stuff. So. Why not do some circuit testing here on Tech Garage? We're all about flow charts. We're all about diagnosing it, doing it right. So let's get started, man. First thing we need to do is look at the schematic and you guys can look at it with us right there. Just like we said, it's a three wire sensor coming down on the purple and white wire. Do you have a purple and white wire there, Dave? Yes, I do. Awesome. Well, that's going to be the five volts. And then, in the, then you have a white with the black wire. Yep. Got one of those too. That's a good sign. Perfect. That's the return going up. And then we should have a gray and black, gray with a black stripe. It's dirty, but I'm going to call it gray and black, and that's the one in the middle. Well, that's a good thing. So far, our wires are right and our schematics right. Well, what if we didn't have the right wires here? Great question. If you don't have the right wires or you don't have the right schematic, back up and punt. Don't just go in there and start poking wires. You can short a computer. You could do a lot of damage to the system. So just go get a right schematic or make sure you figure out what's going on with your wire harness. And, and there's, wrong. there's so many electronics in today's car, so you don't want to mess with anything if you don't have to. Yeah, yeah. Don't poke if you don't know what you're poking. That's for sure when it comes to these terminals. But this one has a flow chart. And you know, Dave, we're all about flow charts because that's going to tell us the integrity of the circuit going from the sensor to the computer. Let's just say, for example, this one's not a sensor. Boy, that's a big problem. Then you have to start chasing the wire harness problems. And this one's pretty simple here. It's just basically going to check for the good continuity from the wire, make sure it's not grounded, make sure we got five volts, make sure it's not shorted, and then we'll go in and we'll actually look at the sensor itself. So this is pretty cool. So let's follow this step by step. You guys join us. We got uh, one of our master techs up there, Trip, and he's going to actually run the key for us so we can do it in a proper sequence. And we'll start with number one, ignition off, disconnect the harness. We got that done. We're going to test for less than one ohms from the actual crank position sensor, low reference terminal to B to ground. So if you go to the actual, let's see, we're going to the gray with the black wire. Yeah, that's the one in the middle. And Trip, if you turn the key off so we don't have anything for ohms of resistance. We should add, by the way, that we disconnected the battery before removing the starter. Excellent an important, point. Important and step. We, and then we went ahead and reconnected it and we actually taped up the wire harness just to be safe because we reconnected the battery. We don't want any arcs or fire. That's a bad thing. Dave, we'll go ahead and get started, man. We want to go ahead and check the actual ground circuit. So we're looking for a resistance problem on the ground circuit. So it wants us to actually turn the ignition off. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go between crank position sensor, low circuit reference, and ground. So if you go to the gray and black, yep. and Trip, if you'd be so kind to turn the key off. So we got the key off, and I'll switch our meter over to ohms of resistance. Okay, there we okay, go. There now we got to find ground. You got to find a ground, probably a good bolt where the starter went in. That yeah, would be a good ground. Should be nice and clean. Yep. Get your ground there, and it's going to flick around. I know it's not going to be easy to find a ground, but once you yeah. do, and the car times out here in a minute, we got all the power off the harness. Okay, so oh, you got, oh, well, got there you go, there you go. Oh, there it's dropping down a little bit, and there it goes. There, Bingo. There. Look at that, point three, and it wants one or less. So we're in now. If it there was high, that means there's resistance in that wire harness. We would have to go check that. Not a problem. Next one, yeah, we'll go ahead and cycle the key back on. Trip, thank you so much. What we're doing now is we're looking for actual 4.8 to 5.2 volts on the five volt reference. Remember that reference coming in on that board yep. that it was actually pulsing. Our truck's doing the exact same thing. So in order to do that, we're going to have to go between C and ground. So let's go between that purple and white okay. and the gray and black, but let's not let those don't, don't touch. let them touch because we're let them short. touch. Yeah, we're creating our own short. We no don't want to do that. Nope. So we'll get that one there and that should be about five volts. All right, let's take a look. We're using the sensor ground so we know we're good. Look at five Bam. volts. Exactly. Yes, good. sir. Now if that was more, you'd be shorted to power somewhere in that wire harness. Not a good thing. Less would be a resistance problem in that wire harness. Okay, so we're good there. Now we got to do is just test the sensor out. All right. So if you take that old sensor, you here put it on there, we'll show yeah. you a trick. And I can go over here to the active counter. We're already set up here, hopefully. Dave, if you just wave it across the new one, we should get some numbers up here. Let's see. Oh, there oh, it goes. Look at, look at that. that. Check it out. 
Man, we wouldn't get any counts before. No, Three, four, go faster. <laughs> High speed. <laughs> Man, nice job. Look at that. There we go. All right. Well, now all we Sweet. have to do is just basically reverse the procedure. Go ahead and put that in. Get just connect the battery. Yeah, that's right. Get the starter hooked back up. That would be great. Well, hopefully that extended crank is gone. You guys don't want to miss that. But before we get to that, we're actually going into Garage Ed. So we'll be right back with more Tech Garage brought to you by rockauto.com. Well, there's a good look at the best crew in the business here at Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Well, folks, it's time for Garage Ed, and we made it through a lot of components, so this week it's all about the brake booster. And I got one right here. You can see out in the open. I'm going to show you how it works, how to diagnose this, and we'll even take a look inside of one. So on our brake booster here, what's happening is it kind of helps with driver assist. So with driver assist, when I push the pedal with the action of vacuum, we'll take a look inside in a little bit. It's going to go ahead and stop the brake. So I'm going to fire up our board. You see everything spinning there. When I push the brake pedal, it's going to multiply the force into the master cylinder and help me stop that wheel. So when I hit it like that, bam, OK, we start stopping the wheels. So here's the deal. Brake booster needs vacuum. So one of the first checks you can do on your car is you can check vacuum to your brake booster. And that's really easy to do. Just find your brake booster on your vehicle and find the vacuum source coming to the booster. That's the one you want to check because that's what we need to get the vacuum into the booster. I'm going to unplug it, put it on a little vacuum gauge, same thing you would do on your vehicle. And then what we want to do is we want to actually read the vacuum gauge. So let me get it in there real good. There we go. All right, and you can see here we have about 20, 20 inches of mercury. That's great. Now you want anywhere from 15 to about 26 inches of mercury, that's normal vacuum. If you had a lack of vacuum, you would have a lack of assist when you went to push the brake pedal. So you would have to find that. Now what's going on inside of there? Well, brake booster's pretty cool. And in true tech garage fashion, I'm gonna pull one apart. It's vacuum actuated, it's busted into two sides. You can have a vacuum suspended booster or you can have an atmospheric suspended booster. Doesn't much matter, but here's the deal. When you have vacuum, it's gonna pull on one side and it's gonna move to the other side. So think about this. If the master cylinder's on this side, what you're gonna have is vacuum entering here and that vacuum is an absence of pressure. So I got 14 PSI here, zero on that side, shoop, helps you pull. Now, if you have an atmospheric suspended booster, you have both sides and I let vacuum enter here. So it just depends on how it's built, but check this out, this is really cool. Let me pull this guy apart and you can look inside of here. There's this giant diaphragm and what this does, it actually separates the atmospheric side from the vacuum side. You guys all heard it, you push the pedal and you hear, shoop, shoop, well, what's going on? Atmospheric pressure is entering through a little filter right here on this end, and it's going inside the booster, and it's allowing it to pull it as driver assist happens. That's a brake booster inside. Now, you can also have what's called a hydro booster. A hydro booster is right here. Now, a hydro booster does the same thing, but it uses power steering to get the job done. So I can basically just break this in half for you, make a simple illustration. If this thing was broken in half, I let power steering come in one side, which is perhaps 1500 PSI, and zero on the other, shoom, it's gonna help you push the brakes. Now, another important piece of that booster is the check valve. The check valve is located right here. Now what the check valve does, it actually holds a vacuum in the booster in case the engine fails. Why do you want to do that? Well, you want at least three emergency stops. So you pump the pedal once, twice, and three times. That's why on that third time, your pedal gets very, very hard. It's very difficult to push. Now on our hydro booster, you have what's called an accumulator right here. This actually holds the power steering fluid in case your engine fails. Couple diagnostics vacuum booster. We already talked about vacuum. This one here, this is bolted up to the master cylinder. So think about this. If you have a leak, you have to determine if it's power steering fluid or brake fluid. It could be your primary piston on your master cylinder, or it could be coming from this side. So just check it and make sure which one you have. Now, you know what? That's some pretty cool tests, but you can do a pedal check right out in the driveway. And our local expert, Dave, he's over there doing a pedal test right now. 
There's a simple test you can do to make sure your booster is working properly, and it's called a pedal check. It's really easy to do. All you have to do is sit in the car with the ignition off, the key out if you have a keyed ignition, and you pump the pedal three or four times until, it, well, as long as it takes to get it rock hard, and there it is. So we've got a, a hard pedal there. So with your foot still on the pedal, you want to either put the key in the ignition and turn it, or in this case, we will press the button to start the car. And when you do, the pedal should drop toward the floor, not all the way down, but it should drop slightly. And if it does, that means you're getting assist from the booster. Let's check it out. Start it up. There you go. Pedal dropped just slightly. That means our booster is working properly. Now, if you end up with a pedal that remains hard, that means you have a problem with the vacuum or you have a problem with your booster and you're gonna need a little more work. Do not go anywhere because we've got something cool for you next. We are cooking up something you're gonna like here on Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, is brought to you by Magic Creeper, the most versatile creeper ever. AP Laser, leading the way. And by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. And welcome to this MTTT, say what? That's right, Master Technician's Tech Tip. This one's all about a small thermostat that can cause catastrophic engine damage. I'm talking about a little part. What does it do and how does it work? Well, let's find out. Come on over to this engine right here and we'll show you how it works. The thermostat's located right here in the block and its job is actually to restrict coolant flow until it gets to a specific temperature. Then it'll open and the coolant flow will come out. And I can actually show you, this one does not have a thermostat. So what's happening when I turn it on, bam, it's allowed to flow. So what's happening with the coolant system? Well, I'm taking coolant into the engine. Law of thermodynamics, it's actually taking the heat, carrying it out, and dissipating it to the outside atmosphere. But the thermostat's an important part of that puzzle. Here's what goes on. It holds the coolant in the engine for a predetermined temperature. Why? Well, it's all about those emissions. It's about that perfect stoichiometric fuel delivery. We want to keep that engine at the right temperature so it'll burn the fuel. Perhaps the engine's really, really cold. I want it to get hot quickly to go into what's called closed loop. Open loop and closed loop. Open loop is real rich. We run it rich. We want to get the car in closed loop, the computer, as quick as possible. So we use a thermostat to do that. Now, how does the thermostat work? Well, it's pretty cool. So what's going on is I'm boiling a thermostat inside of here. Why am I boiling the thermostat? Well, it opens at a specific temperature. And that temperature for this one's rated at about 190 degrees and we're boiling at 212 so it's wide open so I'm gonna reach real carefully inside of here and I'm gonna grab it and I'm hoping that you can see the big gap located right there there's a big old gap in there and what's happening is that wax pellet got hot and when that wax pellet got hot it opened the thermostat it overcame that spring pressure and it opened it it allowed the coolant to flow now if I put it in this cold water zoop, just like that it starts to close Dunk it again, and you guys can see the gaps gone, almost gone, it's nice and cool, bam, snap closed. So now, no coolant can flow. So when I first start the car, down in there, I'm gonna keep the water in there, it's gonna get hot quicker, and we're gonna get the car in good emissions, we're gonna get the car running real good, no matter when you start the car. Now, thermostats, they also come in different shapes, flavor, and sizes. We made the evolution over to an electronic thermostat. This is pretty cool. This actually come off a of BMW, and you can see there's electrical connectors on it. Now, it doesn't open with a solenoid. We thought it did, but, you know, Tom at Rock Auto actually educated us, and we can see here that's what's happening in here is it actually heats up with the wax pellet gets hot with a little heater circuit inside of here, so we can still regulate it with temperature, but the computer's regulating it with temperature. Now, I also have a variable resistor or potentiometer in there so I can see where it's open and when it's open. So, boy, the cars are getting real complex today. They're actually regulating the thermostat just to keep those emissions perfect so you got a good running car and a clean running car. Boy, cars today are sophisticated, and so are Tom and Dave. Let's check in with them. Well, John, thermostats have become incredibly complicated through the years. Tom, you guys at Rock Auto are keeping up with all the technology. Stuff like this, I mean, how, how has a thermostat evolved over well, time? Well, trying to optimize emissions and fuel economy, it's all about control, telling the letting the computer control everything precisely. And that applies to thermostats too. What they, what, this is a BMW example. What they did is they took a conventional thermostat and they put a heater on it 
So there's a heater that heats up and mel melts the wax inside the conventional, what's basically a conventional thermostat and opens the thermostat. So the com computer decides, okay, hey, this, this car is going up a steep hill, we need to open up the thermostat sooner, so heat it up and open it up. Or we want this car to warm up, the engine to warm up faster to Im improve emissions, so keep that thermostat closed a little bit longer. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. And this is from a BMW. Every thermostat is different. How can we locate the one that's correct for our vehicle? Like most parts of rockauto.com, you go to your vehicle, and often now the thermostat is combined with the housing, like this example. So if you don't see individual thermostat, then you'll, you look for thermostat housing water outlet, which is what this is, includes everything. RockAuto.com has all the parts your car will ever need. We are going to wrap this up and send it over that way to my friend John Gardner. Well, it's time to see if the supercharged Silverado's fixed. Trip, fire it up. Oh, man. That's beautiful. Great. Never get tired of that supercharged Silverado. Thing sounds amazing. Where have you been? The show's almost over. I want to get donuts. The last thing that's ever donuts. <laughs> you got donuts, all right, but not those kind of donuts. These kind of donuts. Well, we're out of time, so as the smoke starts to clear, you guys can check us out on social media, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, all that cool stuff. We'll see you next week for more Tech Garage, brought to you by rockauto.com. Give me one of them donuts. This is awesome. I love them. Unbelievable. Production assistance for Tech Garage is provided by Shivala College, located in Mariana, Florida. Founded in 1947, Shivala was ranked recently as one of the top three community colleges in the United States.